Hey everyone, it's Tyler with the Museum of the American Revolution. We're on one of our artisan field trips and we're here with Gianna Violante, one of the costume makers who we work with at the museum. You might have seen her work on our educators. She's made a lot of the gowns we use and elsewhere. And we're here to talk about Jana's work in New York. So Jana, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, um, hello everyone. Yes, I'm Jana. Um, I am working in my home studio um, I'm actually currently in Ridgewood, Queens, um, and yeah, I'm a costume maker. Um, I studied costume design at SUNY Purchase, um, but I got interested in historic clothing making kind of at a young age, um, working at a local historic site um, where I was actually an interpreter. So I was wearing historic clothing and got interested in how it was made and the reasons for the fabric choices and things like that. Um, so that was the first spark of it. That's great. Really cool. Um, Jana, can you tell us a little bit about what drew you to making costumes and gowns and how the work that you do today might be similar or different than what people were doing in the 1770s? Sure. Um, so the big difference, I would say, it, between um, modern costuming and then 18th century clothing making um, would really be the technology. So um, for modern costumes and when they get to use a sewing machine, um, for 18th century clothing primarily, actually completely, it's all hand stitched. Um, so when I'm making a historic uh, dress, I'm going to make all the stitching that's visible on top be hand done versus maybe a long seam down the side or you know down the back I might use a sewing machine for um, but those are that's probably the main difference I find yeah do you have any problems finding the sort of fabrics that people were using in the 18th century are there special vendors you go to yeah so fabric is another one that is tricky to find because of course you want to find something that is the right fiber content that doesn't have like a polyester woven into it um, and you want to find a color that's not, you know, too, too bright because again, it's with a synthetic dye. Um, so a lot of the fabric I actually get to find for projects um, in the garment district here in New York City. Um, you have to sometimes do a burn test on a swatch to see if, you know, it's a pure fiber versus synthetic. Um, but you can also find great fabrics on sites like Burnley and Trowbridge or uh, William Booth Draper. Um, they do really excellent research to source things for you. So am I right in saying that a burn test means that if you light a piece of fabric on fire, it will act differently if it's a natural fiber or a polyester? Yes. So if you take a little piece of wool and you burn it, um, it should smell like, like burning hair and kind of crumble. Um, whereas if it's synthetic, it'll start to like curl and melt and be really disgusting. And that's how you know, like a polyester is wo woven into it probably. Oh, that's really fascinating. I would um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say that's something our viewers can try at home, but they might wanna be a little careful with um, fire in their houses. Yeah. Um, you said you're working in a home studio. Could you tell us a little bit about the workshop that you're in now and what you normally work in if you weren't at home? Yeah. So. Usually I work in a, um, a pretty big costume shop. So I have a big table. We have tons of different types of industrial machines, um, but the shop is closed right now and it's in Manhattan and subways are, not, are out of the question. Um, so home studio that I'm in is much smaller, but I do have a cutting table, which this phone is on. <laughs> I have a ma one mannequin. She's kind of one size, so she gets used for everything. And then behind me, I think you might be able to see, I have a nice um, industrial machine um, and some supplies, but it's uh, the industrial machine is kind of the same as the, that I would have in the costume shop, but for the most part, it's just, it's much smaller and quieter. <laughs> I don't know how much you can share with us about what you work on in the shop when you're not working on 18th century clothing, but some of our viewers might be interested to hear about some of the costuming you do that's not Revolutionary War. Yeah, so 
well, when I'm not working, <laughs> when I'm not working in 100% wool, um, a lot of the stuff that I work on is um, for Broadway um, or dance productions and sometimes for TV shows. Um, I do a little bit with Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which is fun. Um, something uh, like Lion, Lion King on Broadway and um, Book of Mormon are two of our big uh, clients. Um, but that stuff is all to costumes that are to be worn like six days a week over and over with a giant zipper up the back. <laughs> um, they have a very different function than a, than a period garment. So it's, sometimes it's nice to go back to making a historic garment because the attention to detail is much finer. The closures are very different. Um, but yeah. That's cool. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Right now, the resolution is really good. So I thought we might seize the moment for you to show us maybe a, a small technique or a practice that is something that you use that was used in the 18th century. Sure. Um, so um, on the mannequin here, I have a uh, the very beginning of a dress of an English gown. So 1770s English gown, it's a style. Um, it has a stomacher front which is this little piece. It's actually a separate piece. Um, the dress goes on sort of like a jacket, pins down the side. Um, it has a three quarter length sleeve. And then as you get to, to the back, you have um, a, one big rectangle of fabric that starts at the top of the dress and goes all the way to the hem that is pleated in a very nice, um, beautiful line that's a little bit wider at the top and it tapers to the waist and then falls to the hem. Um, but there are two pleats that are um, happening at the at either side of center back. Um, and so what I'm going to do to get them set is what we would call draping. Draping is taking fabric and placing it on the body. Ideally, it's a real, <laughs> in the 18th century, a mantua maker would do this literally on um, the client. Um, we're not doing that today, we're doing it on a mannequin. <laughs> Um, but the idea is the same. You're, you're basically taking the fabric um, and shaping it to your uh, figure. So the pleats at the back are wider at the top and then they get smaller. But as you can see, I'm taking the fabric, I'm pinching it, and then I'm pinning it down flat. I hope you guys can see this. <laughs> to the lining, yeah. And so this pleat will be reflected on the other side of the center back seam as well. But as I pinch it and pin it down, you can see that we're starting to see the shape of the bodice underneath. So before it was a big rectangle and now it's been pleated down to fit um, the figure. So that's one of the parts of making this dress. Um, there's a lot more to go. <laughs> the difference between what I was doing draping and something you might be more familiar with, um, flat patterning, is the three-dimensional versus two-dimensional. So this is actually um, the sleeve of this dress. So I'm kind of combining the two methods. This is going to be um, a pattern that's laid onto the fabric, traced out, cut out, and then stitched into what I want it to be. Um, you really see like tailors using patterns more often. Mantua makers mostly using the draping technique that I just did here. That's really fascinating. And I bet a lot of our audience might want to know how long it might take you to do all the parts of one full gown. Mm -hmm. Um, time-wise, I feel like I could make, and this is a great time to test this out, but I feel like I could make this dress in a week. Um, and that would be just me stitching by myself, using the sewing machine at points for the side seams. Um, for, for the most part, this dress is completely hand-stitched. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Keep going. <laughs> but for the most part, this dress is completely hand stitch, um, which takes a long time. So it's, it, it, I would say a week, start to finish, um, working like eight hour days, roughly. Um, 
Yeah. The tricky part with making of this dress is that I'm not going to have a fitting with my um, client. <laughs> so I'm going to ship it to her. She's going to try it on. We will then FaceTime each other, make the adjustments, and then she'll send it back and I will finish it. Um, but yeah, a week. That's cool. And I, uh, I should apologize for Bertie, who's joined us. He's made a number of appearances on our social media this week. <laughs> um, my one last question is something I think a lot of people might wonder, which is, is this the sort of gown that only a rich person would have been able to afford? It seems like you know, there's a lot of work in making it custom. Or is this something that all sorts of people might have worn? Um, that is a wonderful question. What's really fun about the 18th century and, and fashion is that you see a very similar um, cut, like a cut or the silhouette or style of dress being worn in many different classes. Um, but the fabric and the way that the dress is embellished kind of might signify more of a wealthy dress as opposed to a lower class dress. Um, so this dress is meant to be um, middle class. So it's a nice, it's tough, wool there won't there will be a sleeve cuff but there won't be any um trim on it and for the most part it will be pretty you know pretty accessible and affordable for your average middle class uh woman in 1770s but for example if we made this and this was beautiful green silk taffeta um which is a nice shine to it and it's much more expensive um then it would be an upper class gown so really, it's really in the fabric that you see um, the class shining through as opposed to like the shape of the gown. Yeah. That's great. Um, I'm really excited to say that people might get the chance to see this gown in person at the museum. It's going to go to Kalela Williams, who's an interpreter yes. that we've worked with. Yes. So um, folks will have a chance to see the finished product of all this. Jana, if uh, people have other questions for you and about your work, is there somewhere they can find you online at the moment? Um, yes, if you are curious about what else I'm making and wanna see some fun, sparkly Broadway costumes as well, um, I am on Instagram at uh, lowercase Jana Violante. Um, yeah, that's mostly where I am. <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you again, Jana, for um, joining us for this artisan field trip of the Museum of the American Revolution. And um, everyone can stay in touch and keep an eye out for some of Jana's work at the museum and online.